After having about a month of pure dominance, the Nationals rocket ship has officially landed back on planet Earth. You are Locked On Nationals, your daily Washington Nationals podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Bunches. Download the Bunches app today, and when you do, our friends at Bunches have featured the Locked On MLB Bunch in the Discover tab. You can also click the link in the description slash show notes to join the Locked On MLB Bunch community today. And thank you all for making Locked On Nationals your first listen every single day as we are free and available wherever you get your podcast. And for the everydayers out there, I'm Ryan Clary. You can catch me over on Twitter at RyanClary11 and as well as the show page at LO underscore Nationals for all your latest Nationals tweets and whatever else you want to be looking for on your timeline. Later on in today's show, the Nationals get ready to face the Miami Marlins after beating them this last week and after starting the season 0-6 against the Miami Marlins in which seems like we never do that against the Marlins. But over the last year and a half or so, really even more than that, They've had our number. That's fine. We'll preview that series as the Nationals are back home after a long, long road trip. We'll preview that a little bit later on. And then also, Robert Hassel III, former top 40 prospect, one of the marquee names in the Juan Soto deal. You all know the name, but I'm not sure if everyone's really been paying attention all too much to his 2023 season. And all I'll say for now, it's been a little bit disappointing. I'll get into that a little bit later on, but let's start off with discussing yesterday's loss as the Nationals, they found a way not to win their sixth straight series, and it's as simple as that, but let's be honest. This run that they were just on, beating all these good teams, and really it was, this was a hell of a run, and in fact, over the last month or so, This has been the most fun run that this Nationals team has been on in quite some time. And really, dare I say, been the best run since 2019. I think I could definitely make that argument, but that's not for right here and right now. You started off with this series winning five straight, obviously, five straight series. You start off against the Oakland A's, the worst team in baseball. Good little way to get you up. Then you go against the Boston Red Sox. You win that series as well. Then you go against the Phillies. You win that series as well. Then you head up to the Bronx. You beat the Yankees there, take that series. Then you're at Miami. Again, the team that you started 0-6 against this season, you win that series. Then going up against the Blue Jays, the Nationals finally dropped a series in what felt like for so long this team was just dominant and clicking in all cylinders. And even then, this run that the Nationals have had over this course of the season, it really kind of goes to show you what this team, team could look like moving forward in 2024 it kind of gives you a little glimpse into the future and in fact if you remember 2011 when the Nationals had kind of had that second half push when you got Steven Strasburg back in September now while he was very limited in that time it still kind of gave you a little bit of juice and obviously tomorrow is September we all know what that means September call-ups could be coming up could it be James Wood at this moment in time likely not James Wood But there's going to be some exciting names coming up in this Nationals team here. So it's going to get even a little juicier for that kind of glimpse into the future, kind of looking into next year and really seeing what guys can do. Because that's really what it's about over the next month or so. You're you're going to want to see all these young guys kind of come together and hopefully mold a really good foundation heading into 2024 because we all know the Nationals, now while you're going to be stuck with Steven Strasburg's contract, over the next few years, and really beyond that with the deferred money, they have money to spend, though. And we know that. They have cleared up a ton of cap space, or not cap space, they've cleared up a lot of money over the last few years. And I think this could be the offseason in which we look at that could be a little bit of a game changer. That's when you could get your Jason Worth sort of signing. Because if you remember that 2011 season when the Nationals inched their way closer to having a 50-50 record there, They did that in a very hot stretch, just like they have been doing this season. 
So is next year, is this going to be the year where they break out in 2024 and win 97 games? I don't envision that. And in fact, I don't think many people would envision that at this moment. But going ahead into this offseason now, after this nice little stretch that the Nationals have had, after trading away one of your best bats, J. Mayor Candelario, you can never forget what that guy meant to us and this organization for 2023. He was half our offense alongside Lane Thomas in the first half of this season. And then back in July, C.J. Abrams, or really in June, C.J. Abrams gets hot. Kibet Ruiz gets hot in July. And all of a sudden, the bullpen starts to look pretty damn good. Kyle Finnegan goes on this insane stretch as being one of the better closers in the National League in the second half. There's been a lot of different things that have developed in a nice way for the Nationals. And I think at the forefront of that was probably, honestly, the starting pitching even. Mackenzie Gore and Josiah Gray. Now, while Josiah Gray just had one of his worst months in the majors, Mackenzie Gore looked pretty good. Jake Irvin, after skipping his start, looked pretty good. Even Trevor Williams going out there, he's had a few handful of good starts here and there. Patrick Corbin has held it together for the most part besides yesterday's game. So you're starting to see these kind of pieces come together. And I think that is an important part going into the offseason. Because one, it sends a message to the ownership. It's going to let them know that this team is no longer in this rebuild. Now, while, yes, they're still rebuilding, the rebuild is not done. But you can spend on someone to come in because I think this team could be competitive. And the stretch that we just went on proves that, in my opinion. Let's talk about the Blue Jays game here, as obviously, again, the Nationals failed to lose or failed to win their sixth straight series. And in yesterday's ball game, we kind of talked about it in yesterday's show with Patrick Corbin. You always know he's going to give up two runs in the first inning. That's what he did. Two nothing up early. And even then after that, it was not close. The Nationals just simply did not have their best stuff. The bullpen, fine. Patrick Corbin did not look all too good. Six runs there in those five innings pitch in 10 hits as well. Only walked one batter. But Patrick Corbin, 10 hits in five innings, six earned runs. Just was not the performance that we were expecting. And two, it just kind of stunk, to say the least. Because we all kind of saw this coming. If you were looking in your rearview mirror, and you saw Patrick Corbin coming up, game three of the series, it's 1-1 tie, you could win your sixth straight, and then you have Miami at home, you could win your seventh straight as well. That never came into fruition. And Patrick Corbin, unfortunately, just got shelled yesterday. He did. And even then, on the other hand, Chris Bassett, who last year haunted the Washington Nationals when he was with the New York Mets. Continued the haunting. Eight innings pitch, three hits given up, only one walk, only three strikeouts even, but he just shut us down entirely. And once they got into the bullpen, the Nationals did collect two hits, but even then, five hits in nine innings for this offense who seems to come alive later in the game. And yeah, they did come in, come alive a little bit in the ninth inning there, but that wasn't enough. And when this national team is going up against Bassett, someone who has had their number for a while, you were kind of maybe thinking, well, what about Carter Kibu? Could he come in? He never faced Chris Bassett. Could he come in and have an impact for this team? Could Lane Thomas somehow, some way, get a little hot against him? Because Lane Thomas, as of right now, has an OPS below 800, which seems like the first time that has happened since what? Maybe mid-May, if that. His batting average is also down to a 279 at this moment. Joey Manessis checks in with two hits. Carter Keboom gets a hit. But even then, there's no real damage done as Jacob Young collects his first big league double. That was really the most exciting part of yesterday's ball game. And of course, the web gem covering all the ground in center field from Jacob Young yet again. Yesterday was just one of those games. It was just one of those games over 162 game season over the course of a month. It's going to happen over the course of a week. It's going to happen. It happens to the Dodgers, the Braves, the Rangers, and the Rangers have been terrible recently. It's going to happen. It's not the end of the world. But what I wanted to see in that performance yesterday was a little bit of that scrappiness come back to life a little bit, kind of nip them in the butt a little bit, come back get some runs on the board, 
Because when Patrick Corbin, if you give him some run support, now while you'll never really feel comfortable for being honest here, you just don't. Not when Corbin's on the mound. And that's probably how it should be as well. But if you give him a little bit of run support there, if the offense were to click just a little bit, I think the game and the outcome could have become a little bit different. Now, I'm not saying this to be Captain Obvious over here, but it just is. If you give Patrick Corbin that little comfort early on, if you score two, three runs in the first few innings, give him a nice little lead there, nice little cushion. I think Patrick Corbin probably would have been off a little bit better. And then also, if you don't really give up all those runs too early like Corbin did yesterday, and really the defense wasn't all too terrific as well, then I think this Nationals team probably would have been able to stand a chance because the bullpen was not the issue in hindsight. Andres Machado looked decent. Two innings pitch again. Two hits, one earned run, one strikeout, one walk. His ERA is down to a 5.88. Jose Frere continues to come in, and in my opinion, has looked really good. One innings pitch, one strikeout, no walks, no hits. So the bullpen, for the most part, did their job. Patrick Corbin, on the other hand, unfortunately did not. But that's the thing when you get with him. At this moment, you're taking 2023 Patrick Corbin over the last few years, and it's not even close. 2021, awful. 2022, really awful. So I'll take this slight improvement, I guess. But also kind of just sucks to think here that we could have had. We could have had something. And we could have won our six straight series. But that just didn't happen. The Nationals play the Marlins tonight at 7.05 Eastern Time and catch every pitch of the Nationals' hometown broadcast with SiriusXM on the SXM app. Just search Nationals there. <clears throat> and before we get into discussing Robert Hassel, I also have a little update on Dylan Cruz because I'm not sure if people know, but Dylan Cruz was hit in the head the other night and he did not play in yesterday's ball game. I'll get you up to date on the latest with Dylan Cruz and as well as Robert Hassel. But before we do that, let me tell you guys about our friends over on Bunches. And okay, Locked On Nationals fans, I have to tell you guys about a new app called Bunches. And Bunches is a new app built just for sports fans where you can chat sports in real time. Click the link in the show notes slash subscription to join the app or go to the app store and download Bunches now. I'm telling you, you're going to love the conversations with other Locked On sports fans because Bunches is the free app where sports fans chat. That's right, guys. Locked On MLB group chat is on Bunches. Go there now and connect with other baseball fans. Chat your favorite team and keep up with the latest MLB news. Have any questions or comments about today's episode? Chat about it in the Locked On MLB Bunch on Bunches. Chat about your team every single day and tell a personal story about your experience in the Locked On MLB bunch or maybe you can even call out one of your friends in the community it's going to be a fun nice little nationals community there so download the bunches app today and when you do our friends at bunches have featured the locked on mlb bunch in the discover tab you can also click the link in the description slash show notes to join the locked on mlb bunch community today and now let's get into it as we're going to pre or not preview we're going to discuss Robert Hassel a third season just after I give you a quick uh, Dylan Cruz update. The top five prospect in all of baseball, the number two pick in the 2023 MLB draft. And Tuesday's game was hit in the head with an off-speed pitch. And it's not too concerning. It is not. No one should be overly concerned. It was an off-speed pitch that went off the dome of the head. And at this moment in time, it just kind of feels like it's going to be a day-to-day -day thing. I'm not too worried about it. And I saw a lot of people kind of being like, oh, this could throw off some things, especially considering that he has struggled over his first week or so in double A. But I'm not too concerned by this. At the end of the day, it's going to happen. And it could have been a lot worse as well. If this is a fastball that's going 95 to 100, yeah, that's concerning. But not at this moment in time. An off-speed pitch it's going to happen. It's probably going to hurt. I don't know what will happen from this. Is he concussed? We haven't heard anything from it. But at this moment in time, it's just better to think that it's going to be day to day. And I think that's probably the reasonable way to think about Dylan Cruz because he never really had any injuries at LSU. 
Now, I'm not saying this guy's Superman or anything. I'm not saying he's going to recover as fast as anyone thinks, but it's not the end of the world of what happened. It could have been a lot worse. It was not. He was never on the ground. He walked off on his own power. He seemed to be okay. So I think that's what I'm going to go with is that Dylan Cruz will be okay. I just wanted to get people up to date on that because we'll probably not be in the lineup today as he wasn't in yesterday's contest. But now let's get into Robert Hassel the third. And if you guys remember, Robert Hassel was the marquee prospect. He was kind of the guy at first. And obviously James Wood was in that deal as well. But as far as like national recognition goes, James Wood did not have the popularity as Robert Hassel III. And even then, you could make the case that Robert Hassel is still a bigger name. He was kind of a exciting, flashy player. Robert Hassel III, as soon as he got to Washington, and as soon as he got to high A Wilmington last year, the struggle just continued. It just happened. It never really clicked for him as he got to high A Wilmington last year. Now, we all know high A Wilmington is one of the hardest minor league parks to hit in. But last year when he got there, he finished the season, and again, only 10 games, having a 211 batting average with a 548 OPS. That's a small sample size as whole. But he got up to double A, and even then, he had a 608 OPS in 27 games and a 222 batting average in that time frame as well. The concerning part of those stats is that Robert Hassel was recognized as having a very high hit tool. He's going to hit for average when he gets to the big leagues. That's what we were really promised. That's why he was a first-round pick. That's why he was a top prospect because he showed that tool early on. Because in 2021, in single A and as well as high A, he batted 303 across both those levels. Now, while he saw his numbers decline just a little bit once he got to high A in 2021, he kind of put the doubt away batting 299 again in 2022 before getting shipped off to the nationals and in that time frame as well he also had an 846 ops he also had 10 home runs and 55 rbis in those 75 games he wasn't just showing hitting for average he was showing some power as well and since coming to the nationals since then in 2022 in harrisburg he had one home run in wilmington he had zero home runs and over this season He's got eight home runs. He's played 106 ball games this year, everybody. But the most concerning part about this, in my opinion, is his strikeout rate. His strikeout rate right now is very concerning, considering that this guy was considered one of the better approaches in all of minor league baseball as far as prospects go. This was someone who did not strike out a lot. He only had 113 strikeouts last year and across high A, and as well as double A. And heading into this year now, over 106 games, he has 142 strikeouts. Let me repeat, 112 games in 2022, he only struck out, what? Maybe 112 games, rather. He only struck out in 113 at-bats, compared to 142 strikeouts in less games this year. That is the concerning part when it comes to Robert Hassel, and then not even to mention his numbers have just fallen off on, in total. His slugging percentage was at a 407 in 2022. This year, it's at a 319. In 2021, for example, it was at a 470. So where he sits now, he's not getting extra base hits. That's one. And two, his plate discipline just seems to kind of be all over the place at this point. He's not generating walks at a rate that he once was. Now, while he does have more walks than he does from this point last year, the concerning part about this is that he is now cushioned by James Wood and Dylan Cruz and guys like that and Brady House, Trey Lipscomb. He's no longer the target. He's no longer the guy that you have to circle in red ink to make sure that you get Robert Hassel out. I mean, I'm not going to say he's an afterthought. He's still a big-time prospect. He's still someone that the Nationals are going to rely on down the line. But to say that you cannot be concerned with the lack of production with Robert Hassel so far, that's wrong. It is concerning, in fact. Now, here's the other hand. He did break his hand or break his haymate bone back in the Arizona Fall League last year, and there was reports that he did have that injury as well when he got traded to the Nationals. So that could be part of his kind of fall off in production. 
But at this moment in time, he was healthy entering this season. He had a little bit of a setback down in spring training, but overall, Hassel was healthy. This was supposed to be kind of that breakout season because some people were whispering like, are you a little concerned with what Hassel hasn't done so far back of last season? And I was not. I was certainly on the forefront of him being still a very legit big league prospect. And in fact, I would have probably thought that this time last year, I'd be saying Robert Hassel, if he's not in the big leagues come tomorrow, meaning a September call up, we got an issue. And at this moment, there's no chance Robert Hassel will be a September call up because he just turned 22 years old. That's the good thing. He's still young. He still has promise. He still can develop. But the fall off in production after having that hand injury, that is the concerning part of this. I want to say that maybe it's just the development of him. Maybe the Nationals have to go in there and completely just switch up things, switch up the mechanics, switch up the approach, switch up your launching, whatever it is. But at this moment, You can't tell me that you are just a tad concerned for Hassel. This is a big concern at this moment. Just because of what a lot of people, myself included, had said about him being kind of a can't-miss prospect, someone who's going to be an impact player and above-average big leaguer. I thought of him as the safest prospect in the national system. Well, since then, he's been moved on by Dylan Cruz. I think Dylan Cruz is the safest sure thing out there, even over at James Wood. But he's certainly not more of a sure thing than James Wood at this moment either. And there's even a couple guys down there as well who are in that same conversation. So it is starting to get a little concerning when it comes to Robert Hassel just because of the fact that this guy could have been in the big leagues this second. He could have been in the big leagues a month ago. A lot of people expected that. I expected that, in fact. But it's just not going to happen in 2023. So heading into the offseason... That's going to be a huge thing for this Nationals team. Maybe they send him back to the Arizona Fall League and see if he can get his swing fixed there. But he's going to need at-bats, and he's going to need to see a little bit more production at the plate. You need to see more power. You need to see less strikeouts. because, And also, he just needs to make contact more. That is the concerning part when it comes to hassle. So the fix at this moment, there is no fix. There is no obvious fix for him. Obviously, the Nationals will have a plan for him. But at this moment, from what we have seen over the course of the entire season now, it is concerning, to say the least, that he just has not produced at really any level that he's been at. The Nationals play the Marlins tonight at 7.05 Eastern Time. You can catch every pitch of the Nationals' hometown broadcast with SiriusXM on the SXM app. Just search Nationals there. And, of course, the Nationals are playing the Marlins tonight so you'll want to catch that we'll preview that but before we get into the preview of the nationals marlin series let me tell you guys about our friends over at fanduel and get ready for the nfl season with incredible offers from fanduel america's number one sports book right now new customers can bet five dollars and get 200 in bonus bets guaranteed plus All customers who bet $5 will get $100 off NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. You know I like a bargain, so you know I'll be doing that. Now is the best time to join FanDuel. The app is easy to use, and you can be on everything from spreads to player props and much, much more like future props as well. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season with an offer you will not want to miss again FanDuel.com slash locked on FanDuel, the official sports betting partner of the NFL. Now we get back into it as the Nationals are taking on the Miami Marlins today as Yoan Adone is going up again, once again, Braxton Garrett, the former top 10 pick back in 2016 from the Miami Marlins. Yoan Adone, again, a very intriguing case with him. He's kind of in the same category as Patrick Corbin, where you never really know what you're going to get. And now while he has kind of battled these cramping injuries over the season, it's not really injuries, but he's cramping. We all know what a cramp is. It sucks. Last game and over the last two games, he's been drinking pickle juice the night before the game. That is an incredible story. One of my favorites of 2023. 
just because it's one of those old remedies that your grandmother or grandfather would tell you about. And it's kind of something that you're like, does that really work? Well, you want to look pretty good his last time around against the Marlins as well. So I think maybe we have something with this pickle juice. Maybe, just maybe we do. I don't know what to say of it. Is it going to work? Is it really a long-term solution for Yoan Adone? Maybe. But at the end of the day, if it's going to work for him, then that's fine. Whatever it may be. But going up against, again, someone who has the capabilities that Braxton does, it gives you a little bit of a concern. But here's the thing. We all know what every GM in baseball loved to knock Lane Thomas about. You can't hit right-handed pitchers. Well, good thing's good here. Braxton, left-handed pitcher, going up against Lane Thomas, Joey Manessis, C.J. Abrams on the other hand as well. Lane Thomas is going to be someone that I want to kind of hone in on tonight. I want to see what Lane can do because he has been in a little bit of a slump in this second half of the season. His numbers have deflated a little bit. Again, an OPS of under 800 for what feels like has been forever since that has happened with him. It's going to be an interesting series, but nonetheless, the Marlins coming to town, four-game series, it'll always be a fun one, and especially after you just took two or three against them. Let's do it again. Let's get back on this winning track because I miss it. Thank you all for making Locked On Nats your first listen every day. The Nationals play the Marlins tonight at you-know-what time, 7.05 Eastern time, as Yoan Adone, the pickle juice man, could probably shove it against the Miami Marlins. Catch every pitch in the Nationals hometown broadcast with SiriusXM on the SXM app. Just search Nationals there. And of course, this will be a fun matchup tonight as the Marlins are in town. The Nationals are also back in town after a nice little road trip there. We'll discuss everything about this series on tomorrow's show with, and also, I am joined by Bobby Blanco. We'll discuss the Marlins series, and also, we'll take a little look into 2024 as this Nationals team, they got an intriguing future. We'll discuss that and much, much more. But other than that, I'll catch you on the flip side. You are Locked On Nationals.